We'll begin with our prayer to St. Jude. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant, and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many, but the church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me, who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you, to bring visible and speedy help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need, that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations, and sufferings, particularly. And that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jude, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. St. Jude, pray for us and for all who honor and invoke thy aid. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Go home to your family and announce to them all that the Lord in his pity has done for you. To understand what St. Mark is trying to teach us in the Gospel today, we have to remember that the current occupying and oppressing enemy in the land of Israel is the Roman legion. In this scene, a man is freed from the possession of the demons named Legion. And those demons are cast into the sea. St. Mark sees in this event and expects us to see in this event a repeat of the Exodus story. When God, by his mighty hand, freed the Israelites from the oppressing enemy of the Egyptians and drowned the Egyptians in the Red Sea, Jesus is God incarnate. And as God saved the Israelites from their enemies of old, so Jesus is saving this man who's a Gentile. The ten towns of the Decapolis are Greek. Jesus is saving this man and thus saving all of humanity from the enemy that truly oppresses us. God has come among us to defeat Satan and the evil spirits. And he has come to take away our sins. There are two responses to this in the gospel. The people who have witnessed the miracle, who don't question it, are nevertheless seized with fear. To encounter Jesus is going to mean a change in our life. And change is not comfortable and always involves some kind of loss and suffering. The man who has been freed, on the other hand, pleaded to remain with him. Whatever the cost, he needed to be with the one who saved. Today we focus on the lively faith of Mary, which is in some ways mirrored in the response of this Greek convert. Like the ardent charity that we discussed yesterday, faith as a virtue is a gift. It's called a theological virtue because It comes from God and prepares and perfects us, not just for this life, but for the life to come. It allows us to recognize 
and hold on to truths too great for our mind to grasp on its own. The realization of what is hoped for and evidence of things not seen. Because as amazing as the human mind is, we are finite and God is not. And yet he has called us to share in the reality of his own divine life, to share in the wonder of his his incarnation, the mystery of our redemption, and to encounter his grace through the sacraments in his mystical body, the church. All things requiring a gift of faith if we are going to grasp them and live by them in fidelity and trust and receive them finally for eternal life. But even as we receive faith and hope and charity as gifts from God that we could not have possibly caused in ourselves, they still require practice. They still require us to engage them if we want them to grow and be fruitful. Sometimes we speak of faith, which we never really lose. But we speak of it nonetheless as being dead. Dead in us through either mortal sin, or as the epistle of St. James points out, through a lack of good works. And perhaps this is why it's so important to recognize not just the faith, but the lively faith of Our Lady. The lack of sin in her life and that ardent charity with which she served those around her gives a liveliness to her faith unequaled by anyone in history. Like the man in our gospel today, Mary wanted to always remain with the Lord. At the Annunciation in the Gospel of Luke, we're given clear evidence that she intended to dedicate her life to God in perpetual virginity. And so is rather surprised when the angel suggests she's going to have a child. But her lively faith also enables her to immediately accept the angel's word and to take on that mission that she receives. Not because she can reasonably understand how she will conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit, but because she knows and trusts the Lord and has given herself to him in that fidelity of faith. Jesus also gives a mission to the man in today's gospel. Go home to your family and announce to them all that the Lord in his pity has done for you. And likewise, it isn't something that the man simply comprehends. Why doesn't he get to remain with the Lord? And yet in his newfound faith, he receives his mission and carries it out faithfully. We're told, then the man went off and began to proclaim in the Decapolis what Jesus had done for him. And all were amazed. We have to go forward a chapter in the Gospel of Mark to see the fruit of this man's faith. 
Jesus later returns to the region. And the same people who today were seized with fear and begged him to leave their district, this time immediately recognize him. And scurry about the surrounding country and begin to bring in the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. The man's fidelity to his mission brings about the conversion and the salvation of the Greeks. Our Lady's fidelity to her mission brings salvation to us all. The letter to the Hebrews today reflected on the power and wonders of that were worked through the faith of the patriarchs and prophets of old. Yet all of these, though approved because of their faith, did not receive what had been promised. We have received the promised salvation. And if we practice and cultivate our faith, avoiding sin, seeking to be with the Lord and responding in trust and fidelity to the particular mission he has given each of us. We too can see a lively faith in our lives to bear fruit in the salvation of others. And this is why we come to the one who saves, and we come especially to his presence here in the Eucharist. To plead to remain with him. Because we know his power and his love through faith. And we prepare to respond to his call with whatever change may need to come in our lives. May we be freed from the sins that oppress us and imitate the lively faith of Our Lady as we too receive our mission to go home to our families and friends and announce to them all that the Lord in His pity has done for us. And so let us pray our Novena prayer to Our Lady. O Immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of Mercy, you are the refuge of sinners, the health of the sick, and the comfort of the afflicted. You know my wants, my troubles, and my sufferings. By your appearance at the Grotto of Lords, you made it a privileged sanctuary where your favors are given to people streaming to it from the whole world. Over the years, countless sufferers have obtained the cure for their infirmities, whether of soul, mind, or body. Therefore, I come to you with St. Jude as my patron to implore your motherly intercession. Obtain, O loving Mother, the grant of my requests. Through gratitude for your favors, I will endeavor to imitate your virtues, that I may one day share in your glory. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.